It's no secret the pandemic has exacerbated feelings of isolation and loneliness, especially in teens. But new data from the CDC is bearing out just how much young people have been struggling with. Among teenage girls in particular, nearly 60% have reported feeling persistent sadness in 2021. That is double the rate of teenage boys. And overall, the CDC study is reporting the highest rates of sadness in a decade. Among LGBTQ teens, the data is especially alarming, with 22% reporting a suicide attempt in the year before the survey, close to four times the rate of their heterosexual peers. And for teens of color, violence in school is a serious concern. More than 10% of indigenous, black, and Hispanic students have reported uh, staying home over fear of violence, the most out of any other group. So what's behind all of these numbers? And what can we do to help teenagers in this country feel safe and healthy? We're going to have a conversation about it. To discuss this, I'm with uh, Ivana Solana. She is the founder and executive director of Love Your Magic. It is a group that holds conferences and camps and school programs to promote healthy development of black and brown girls. And Dr. Laverne Mosley is a child and adolescent psychologist at Boston Medical Center and a clinical assistant professor of psychology at Boston University School of Medicine. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So Dr. Mosley, I want to talk to you uh, because I know that you work with, um, you know, this population that seems to be the most vulnerable here when we're talking about these numbers. Um, did it surprise you that the CDC survey came up with these trends? Uh, not at all. Um, we, over time, we have seen, you know, increases in um, violence um, among young folks. The pandemic itself bore out a whole new set of numbers uh, because a lot of individuals were really struggling with, um, you know, making that adjustment to being isolated. Um, there were long-standing, um, you know, issues that were not addressed. There, there have always been issues around limited uh, access to treatment, and so there were things that ended up lingering for a lot of young folks, and they didn't really have the outlets that they normally would have to be able to address those concerns that they were feeling, particularly during the pandemic. And when we're talking about this number between teenage girls and teenage boys, the difference seems to be staggering. Um, what do you think contributes to that? There are a lot of, um, you know, for girls, what we would see oftentimes is that they engage in more like the internalizing behaviors, right? So more of the anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, things that were kind of on the inside that were not really um, expressed um, as readily as they probably would with boys who would engage in more of the, you know, aggressive externalizing behaviors and fights. Um, but we've seen like an increase in irritability for a lot of individuals, for a lot of young girls. And so that now created this, um, this space, right, where a lot of, um, uh, you know, like old, you know, feelings were just kind of like pent up and it had to come out some way, you know, in some way. And so that's where we're seeing more of that irritability, more of that anger, more of that frustration is coming out in, in other ways. And this is the only way to for them to be able to get it out. So that's why we're seeing more of that. In mm -hmm. terms of, you know, the feelings of, of suicide um, or, or thoughts of suicide, oftentimes when we're thinking about young folks who have not really been able to fully, um, you know, understand, you know, how to navigate life, um, you know, the, the idea of suicide is like it's an out, right? They feel that there are no mm. more options, mm. no more, there are no other ways out, right? And they and they, they feel kind of at a loss as to how to manage what it is that they're feeling. And so the only way is, okay, no holes barred. You know, I, you know I'm going to, you know, by any means necessary, I'm going to get out what it is that I'm feeling. And so we see that either internalized in terms of suicide or externalized in terms of, you know, how they're going to, you know, get back at someone, you know, if they feel that they've been, um, you know, disrespected or harmed in some way. When we think also of social media and the amount of, um, you know, those upward ticks in, uh, you know, people recording aggressive behaviors, it's now become something that's more normalized in our, in our culture and in our environments. And so it's like, this is, this is the norm. This is what we do when we're upset or someone has disrespected us, we have to now, you know, um, 
you know, externalize these 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 behaviors or these feelings. Yeah, social media certainly changes the game. Ivana, you know, you work with these young women through your programming, through your conference and in other work. I mean, how are you seeing this play out when you're engaging these young women? I would echo much of what's been said. I think a lot of our young girls are experiencing a lot of irritability. Um, they're finding themselves in situations where they're, where they're not 100% sure on how to respond. Um, I think a lot of social media has been triggering a lot of uh, violence in schools. A lot of times it's triggering a lot of like arguments in our schools as well. Um, and so as an organization, we've really tried to uh, give our girls the tools that they need um, so that they can respond in those situations in a way that is productive. Really encouraging our girls to have conversations or to develop coping skills that they can use in those instances to calm themselves down or to take themselves away from those situations to take care of themselves and make sure that they are not responding in a way that is aggressive or in a way that can perhaps put them in more trouble than they perhaps have um, experienced in schools. We were talking before the show about how you really try to address negative self-talk with these girls. Yes. Yes, we've, we, as an organization, one of the things that we really talk about is self-love. Um, self-love is huge for us as an organization. I think a lot of times our black and our brown girls are socialized to think that they're either too much or not enough. Um, and they really internalize those messages. And as a result, um, it leads to them lashing out. Um, it leads to them responding to, uh, you know, messages from their peers or messages from their teachers or from the school or society in a way that uh, perhaps they normally wouldn't respond in. And so as an organization, we really want to shift the way that our young people see themselves. We want our young people to know that you are enough just as you are. You are beautiful. You are intelligent. And regardless of what other people say, you get to shape the way that you see yourself and you get to shape the way that others see you as well. Dr. Mosley, if I'm a parent at home, I might, and it's post-pandemic and my family's trying to recover financially, recover physically. How do you notice that your teenager is struggling? You know, it's, I, I, when I speak with a lot of parents, I talk with them a lot about the importance of having conversations with your kids. Something as simple as, you know, pro providing the space to be able to talk about what they're, what's going on in their day. How are they feeling? Right. But as a parent, you would also notice certain symptoms. You know, um, is, is your child more depressed or irritable than you've noticed them to be over time? Like, are, are they, have they made a change from their usual baseline? Right. I think that everyone is trying to kind of come out of this um, pandemic and all of the, the stressors that they've experienced as a result of this. And it, it, it's like a... Um, it's, it's something that we haven't seen before, right? So making those adjustments and making those changes, you know, can be really, um, you know, very difficult because we're in uncharted territory, right? This is just like new waters that parents are trying to, to navigate. And so it's the same even for their child. But being able to have a conversation um, with, with your child about, you know, how they're feeling, how, what are their peer relationships like? What are the new stressors that they may be feeling? Are you noticing that they're withdrawing from you know their their usual activities, are you noticing that they're sleeping more, or there has been a change in their in in, in their eating? Has there been weight loss or weight gain? You know, so it, be, doing something as simple as trying to engage with your child, right, and not avoiding some of those hard conversations is the place to start, right? So if if you um, you know can get back to some of those routines that that we may have had. Um, you know, in years gone by where folks were sitting down to have a meal together mm -hmm. in a lot of homes, that's not really happening much anymore. You know, everyone's kind of doing their own thing, but being able to create space for um, conversation, being able to also share, you know, that, that there may be fears that you as a parent has, you have, have as well, you know, um, or things that you're nervous about or worried about being able to kind of open the, the conversation and have that dialogue so that it, um, so that we can remove that stigma that oftentimes is there around talking about mental health concerns. Mm. I want to pull out some numbers, too, from this uh, survey here. We know that of the number of teen girls who have experienced sexual violence, that's at 15% in 2017. It's up to 18% in 2021. And when we're talking about boys... 
again, that is so much more than the, the reported sexual violence that they've experienced when we're talking about 4% in 2017 and 5% in 2021. This uptick in, in sexual violence has got to be part of this conversation around mental health and discussing it. And Ivana, you know, I imagine in some of your programming when you're talking to these young girls and teaching them how to talk about serious things, that heavy things come up. How do you navigate or help them navigate through those difficult conversations, whether it's with their parent or a peer or someone else they trust? I think as an organization, one of the things that we prioritize is acknowledging the fact that our young people are the experts of their own experiences. As adults, oftentimes we want to uh, bring in our perspective and we think that we know what is best for our young people. But I think the most important part when speaking to our young people is to listen to what they have to say. Um, really creating spaces, intentional spaces, to listen to how they're feeling, to listen to what it is that they need. Um, and nine times out of 10, they will tell you exactly what it is that they need. Um, and together we can create in having those conversations, we can create um, a community where we can support each other. Um, I think for us, it's been really critical to have restorative conversations where we are discussing the difficult topics that perhaps are not being discussed at home. And I think one of the things that we really prioritize is not only supporting the young people, but also bringing in the caregivers that are supporting the young people that we are serving as well. Um, and I think it's really important to also provide services and supports to the family because, you know, it's really easy to provide supports and to uplift and amplify our work and give young people the resources and the supports that they need. But if we're not doing the same with the adults, then a lot of that gets undone when they perhaps are going home or are going into schools and classrooms. And so we want to make sure that we as a community shift our perspective and realize that the well-being um, of our young people is our collective responsibility. Mm. Dr. Mosley, how important is this pe this access to mental health provider piece because we know that we've been hearing about these shortages in this space especially people who specialize in treating young people it, it's it's been really uh, you know really tough you know because even as we think about the collaboration between schools um, and even mental health providers that was something that pre-pandemic um, you know we tried to ensure was happening we had all of this time where kids who would normally, you know, maybe if they didn't have access to a primary care provider or access, you know, to a therapist, they were at least able to go to their school and have a guidance counselor or someone that they could speak to or a social worker they could speak to. We had this period of time where all of those, you know, those natural resources, you know, for lack of a better term, were, they were gone. So kids were trying to navigate this path themselves. Right. And then with the pandemic, we had a lot of programs that closed mm -hmm. a lot of programs that would have been like intermediaries, um, like partial hospital programs or inpatient um, uh, facilities. They, they reduced their numbers of, of, of beds. Right. And, um, and and a lot of folks probably felt kind of um, uh, at a loss as to where they could access services, you know, if they if they didn't have a, a space that they could actually go to. And so folks were trying to deal with a lot of these things on their own. Yeah. We're seeing, um, you know, such a, uh, you know, it's also a stress and a, a strain even on the mental health system and on the providers because, you know, we're getting calls, you know, that and, and we don't have enough providers to be able to, um, you know, create that support that's needed. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a call, you know, like a clarion call. I also have, you know, I have a group private practice and I was talking with some of the providers yesterday about, um, uh, you know, it, making referrals of, of folks to come in because we don't have enough bodies to be able to um, treat the, the, the kids and the, the adults who are coming in who are really in distress. Um, why there is a, a shortage, it's, it's hard to say, you know, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it that, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, people who left you know, the work or there just wasn't enough access or now more people are aware um, that something is not right and they need, they need that help and, and it's just too much for the system. Yeah, at this absolutely. Well, we're going to have to leave this conversation. There's so much more to talk about, to think through, but I want to thank you both for being with me. Uh, Ivana Solano, thank you so much. Thank you. And Dr. Laverne Mosley, thank you. Thank you.